thank you again to Catherine and her panel uh, for a great discussion on the, on the last session. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, on this panel and uh, talk about the phenomena of what we call mortgage rate lock, which is a uh, concept that isn't common in the vernacular, so we're not, it's not uh, common usage right now, but I think it's going to be a lot more common and we're going to be talking about it a lot more in the years to come. So before bringing up the next panel, I thought it might be useful just to kind of give a quick introduction about what is mortgage rate lock and, and what, is, what do we mean when we describe that uh, you know, or use that term. So in order to do that, I thought it might be useful to describe uh, my own personal experience with this. You can advance the slides. There we go. So a few years ago, when I uh, sold my last house and, and bought my most recent house, I was sitting in a house with a mortgage of about 8% at that time. And the house that I was going to buy, I was able to obtain a, uh, a mortgage rate on a, a mortgage rate of about 5%. So that presented me with a couple different options. One, I could stay in the same size house, and since my financing costs were less, I could have a lower monthly payment and take that as savings. Or alternatively, I could keep the same monthly payment and um, same monthly payment and, and, and get a bigger house because I was taking those financing costs and pouring that into a bigger house. And of course, being American, uh, we chose to, to get a bigger house. Uh, so my situation here was not uncommon. And in fact, uh, millions of Americans really over the past 30 years have had this same experience when mortgage rates have drifted down from about 17, 18% back in the early 1980s through today, uh, where in December 2012, they bottomed out at about 3.3% on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So really, over the past 30 years, we've had this period of declining mortgage rates. Yes, annually up and down and some volatility, but generally a story of declining mortgage rates where people have had the same tailwind that I had, where they were able to take the lower mortgage rate and roll it in to get a bigger house, which made it more likely that they want to move, uh, move up and, and trade a home. Uh, unfortunately, we think that this mortgage rate environment is definitively drawn to an end. It's not an issue of whether rates will, will rise again, but, but rather when. I mean, we can't have another 30 years where rates keep, get, keep going below 3.3%. So they may not go back up to 17, but they're certainly not going to go down from 3.3. And in fact, we're already back up to rates in the low 4% range. And depending on the forecast you look at, over the next, say, two to five years, we'll be back up probably above 5%. And at 5%, it's important threshold because the dynamic I just described in my own situation gets turned exactly on its head, where now we'll have a bunch of homeowners sitting in homes with mortgages of 3.3%, and they're going to go into the housing market and try to buy a new house, and they'll be looking at a mortgage rate of, say, two or three years of 6%. And then they'll be confronted with a situation where just to buy the same house they're sitting in right now, it'll be more expensive for them to buy that same house. And if they want to keep, uh, if they wanted to buy that same house, it'll be more expensive. And if they want to keep their mortgage rate the same, they're going to have to buy a smaller house. So this raises all sorts of interesting issues. Uh, is that going to make people less likely to want to trade homes and move? Uh, is that going to have an impact on existing home sales? Will that impact, in turn, have a, have a d dynamic that plays out in terms of home price growth? And also, how will this affect policymakers' appetite to change rates over this period of time? Or how concerned are they going to be with this dynamic that's changed now from how it was in the past 30 years, where mortgage rate declines have been a tailwind and are now a headwind? How concerned are they going to be about that? So to help us understand this issue a little bit better, I'm delighted to uh, introduce a panel that will be moderated by Wall Street Journal's Nick Timoros. And uh, we'll have Mike Frentantoni, Chief Economist for Mortgage Bankers Association, um, Chris Thornburg from Beacon, Beacon Economics out in California, Joe Tracy from the New York Federal Reserve Bank, and Lawrence June, Chief Economist of the National Association of Realtors. So I'm going to go ahead and have them come up to the stage, but we're also going to show a short video after they're seated. So uh, please join me in welcoming the panel. I'm sorry, we actually don't have a video for this uh, presentation, so Nick, you're on. Hi. Great, so we'll go straight into it. And, and to reintroduce the panel, so we have Chris, Joe, Mike, and Lawrence. And I'm thrilled to um, uh, have such a great panel and a, a really interesting um, discussion to jump into today. So uh, first off, I want to ask Joe, because he's done some research on kind of broader questions of household mobility and, and lock-in effects from housing. Um, Kind of what have what what have you studied and what have you found when it comes to uh, impacts on either uh, mortgage rate, um, 
uh, home equity, negative equity lock-in or property tax lock-in effects? So let me uh, first start with a disclaimer, uh, since I'm from the New York Fed, which is that uh, I'll just be giving you my own views, not those of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York or the Federal Reserve System. And so as Nick mentioned, uh, I've done some work actually with colleagues at, uh, at Wharton, uh, Fernando Ferreria and Joe Jerko, looking at the broad theme of financial frictions to homeowners selling and moving their homes. And uh, these frictions have taken the form of uh, lower negative equity. And then, uh, as in the introduction by Stan, uh, what we call a, a fixed rate mortgage uh, interest rate lock-in. And these emanate from a couple of typical features in uh, US mortgages. So we all know that you're required to put a down payment in your mortgage. But if uh, subsequent to that, house prices fall, you don't get a call from your lender saying, well, we have a margin call, and you need to bring your equity back up to your original down payment percentage. So the fact that there are no margin calls, no maintenance margin, as some would call it, uh, for these mortgages means it's more likely than if you have a uh, falling house price environment that people are going to have low or possibly even negative equity. The other couple of features that are important, and, and actually Stan's slide gave you one of the exceptions, is that most mortgages in the United States are not portable, meaning you can't take it with you when you move and just sort of move the mortgage to a new home, nor are they assumable, meaning you can sort of sell your mortgage on to the buyer as long as they qualify, and the FHA was an example where they are assumable. And it's these features of no, no margin calls and no portability or assumability that give rise to some of these frictions. So the first one we looked at, uh, which became quite prominent with the housing bust, is the impact of falling house prices. So you may still have positive equity, but you have less than what you originally put down in your home. So if you want to move and buy another home, the problem is you won't have enough to fund the down payment. So the financial friction there is I need to basically come up with some additional financial uh, money to put into being able to buy and move. Now you could buy and you could sell and rent, but if prices fall further and you get pushed into negative equity, now the friction's even greater because you can't even say sell and rent because you would need to put extra money into the deal to avoid in a default. And so we expected to find, uh, especially in the case of negative equity, that this would act as a friction in terms of people choosing to sell and move. What we found in the data, and this was data going up to 2009, so we're really looking at house prices through 2007, and we do pick up final mobility between people moving from 07 to 09. And the data ran from 1985 to 2009. But most of the negative equity was toward the end of the sample was that on average, people who were in negative equity sold their home about 30% less often. So that was a pretty significant uh, friction to mobility. Now, as house prices have started to come back, you know, negative equity is starting to diminish as a problem, but what our worry now is we're going to be shifting to this other friction, which is we've had this period where we've put a lot of people in these historically low 30-year fixed rate mortgages that they can't take with them and they can't sell off to uh, someone who may want to buy their home. And so... As Stan mentioned, just to take out an equivalent size mortgage on a new home, it's going to cost you more. And so just do a, a simple calculation. Uh, we thought about a borrower with, say, a 4% mortgage uh, and on, a, say, a $200,000 balance. Suppose down the road they want to take out, you know, move, take out a new $200,000 mortgage, but rates are up at 65 What's that going to cost in terms of added expenses per year? Well, that's about $3,700 in extra costs. So how big of a friction is that? Well, we looked in the data at earlier periods where we had sort of rising interest rates. Even though we had that, the secular trend down, there were uh, periods where rates were rising. And we found that about every $1,000 additional cost of moving from this fixed rate uh, mortgage reduced mobility or the probability that folks were going to sell by about 16%. Is that $1,000 annually? 
annually. Yes. So in my example, I gave you it was 3,700. So that translated into almost a 60% decline in the probability that someone would be selling. To check this and see, well, is this estimate reasonable, we looked at another financial friction which arose from uh, property taxes uh, in California where they would be capped out at a rate of increase at 1% if prices were rising faster. But then once you sell a house, thing you pay basically on the full value of the house. And so that also can create a financial uh, friction to moving. And we found a very similar impact per $1,000 arising from the Prop 13 property tax as we were finding from these fixed rate mortgages. And that made sense to us because it's just money. So it shouldn't matter where the friction is coming from. And so I do think that uh, as we are sort of slowly getting the negative equity friction behind us, and that would hopefully be starting to foster more housing transactions, we may be moving into another headwind, which is coming from the fixed rate mortgage lock-in as rates do rise. Yeah, th thank you, Joe. Uh, and so I think an important piece of this is um, what your expectations then are for interest rates, the extent to which this is going to be a problem will, will rely heavily on where you, where you see interest rates going. I won't ask you because I know you can't answer uh, being affiliated with the Fed. <laughs> but for the, the rest, most interesting answer. Though. Yes. <laughs> but for the rest of the panel, um, you know, and I'll start with you, Chris. Give us your thoughts on where, you know, where you see interest rates the end of this year or a year from now. Because uh, I think that'll help answer how much you think this right. is a problem. Yeah. Well, it's funny because there are a lot of folks, of course, who have been having fairly dire predictions regarding interest rates. Uh, gee, quantitative easing is behind us, and that means interest rates, particularly mortgage rates, are start shooting up. And of course, here we are at the end of quantitative easing, and, and none of that has occurred, um, in large part because QE never had as much of a dramatic impact on long-term interest rates as as some of the commentators have suggested. Uh, we have to keep in mind that for all the dramatic numbers around QE, the couple trillion dollars pumped into the economy, quote unquote, uh, of that amount, 85% of that cash never got into the economy. It's sitting in the bank's form of excess reserves, which, by the way, is, is a known ratio. It's a known issue. The examples we have of QE in the past show that most of that money sits in the bank's form of excess reserves. And for every ten dollars you want, or every dollar you want to get in the economy, you got to do literally ten dollars worth of QE just to get that money passed through. Ultimately, this was about preventing deflation. I think they did a good job. And though thus getting rid of it shouldn't have any dramatic impact on interest rates on the other side of it. So what drives interest rates? Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's the same thing that drove it before QE was even a, a, a dream in Ben Bernanke's head. And that, of course, uh, it has to do with just basic supply and demand for capital. We live in a world that is today a wash in capital. Whereas, on the other side of the equation, demand's still relatively low. We've heard all the numbers about how CapEx is relatively low across the world. Obviously, the housing market is still, construction housing market is still very depressed. Europe, of course, exists. Uh, it's, it's just pulling out of a downturn, and even there, growth is relatively slow. You add it all up, lots of supply, not a lot of demand. That would suggest interest rates are not going to go very far up. They probably will drift up slowly, but that's the operative word, slowly. If they hit 5% at the end of two years, I'd be shocked. So if, if that's your view on interest rates, uh, how big of a threat do you think the, uh, mortgage rate lock-in is over the next, again, over the uh, next I, I Honestly, I, I don't think it's a threat. <laughs> um, and it's not, not to dismiss the research that's been done, but A, has already noted, um, the really dramatic influence out there has got to be negative equity. We know that's starting to burn off. We're back to something on the order of $14 trillion worth of, of net equity in the housing market today, which is very close to where we were in 05. Uh, now the credit is starting to loop, loosen up a little bit. Some of the restrictions are, are allowing credit to flow a little bit more easily. Uh, that's going to give a big secondary surge to the market over the course of the next couple of years. I see home sales starting to pick up towards the end of this year, and I think next year is going to be a great for home sales. And I just don't see interest rate lock-in being a, a functional part of that equation because, again, I don't think interest rates have gone up that much, and I don't expect they will. All right. Mike? Um, I think Chris is going to be shocked. So uh, our, our forecast has mortgage rates at a little above 5% by the end of next year. Uh, you look at the news this morning, uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance at their lowest level in almost nine years. Uh, you had a very strong job report in, in June, and we think that's going to continue. Lots of signs that pace of growth is going to pick up and very clear signs from Federal Reserve that they're going to be ending their purchases and uh, are starting to make moves towards raising short-term rates and 
certainly expect that that mean short term rates going from effectively zero to something like 4%, 3.5%, 4% over a fairly short period of time. So that's going to put upward pressure on rates. Um, to your second question, whether that means lock-in is a big deal, I don't think it's going to be, be a big deal at 5.1%, which is where we think rates are going. Um, but if it got to 65 yeah, it would certainly have a, a much more of, uh, of an impact. I think if you go back to Stan's picture, though, which I thought was, what was helpful, I think that's, uh, to use the economist's word, that was ceteris paribus, right? And it, it's unlikely that everything else is going to be held equal. And when we think about affordability in the housing and mortgage market, three-legged stool, right? What's happening to home prices? What's happening to mortgage rates? And most importantly, what's happening to household incomes, okay? Uh, mortgage rates likely going up, home prices increasing but at a slower rate. Household incomes really haven't grown at all over the past several years. And our expectation is that now unemployment rates down to 6.1, as it gets below 6 to the mid fives, we think we're going to see wage uh, growth pick up. So that's going to be allow that household who wants to move uh, to be able to support that payment, even if it's at a higher rate, because their income has grown over the inter interceding years. Um, it'll be a headwind, but it's not going to be a big deal. And this last point I want to make is you have to think about this lock-in effect in a context of what's happening to mobility over the past you know, dozen, 15 years. And the Census Bureau just put out some very interesting numbers on this. Mobility is falling, and it's falling rapidly. It's falling for owners. It's falling for renters. It's falling really across the board. And you gotta, you got to really wonder what, what's causing that. Does that predate the recession? It does. It, it, uh, the slope of it has increased uh, after the recession and during the recession. But it, it really is a big deal. And you know, we had some research done a few years ago by, by Bill Fry at, at Brookings. And what really leapt off the page at me was you know, typical mobility by different age groups. Right? People in their 20s and 30s, 30% you know, of them move every year. Right? By the time people get into their 50s and 60s, you're less than 5% are moving every year. The baby boom cohort, like it always does, is, ha is having such a large impact on the U.S. because as they're moving to these uh, older age groups, overall mobility rates are just coming down very, very rapidly. And I think that's going to outweigh any lock-in effect. That'll be an additional sort of kicker to it, but I think this demographically driven decline in mobility rates is probably the most important factor. And, and Lawrence, your view on rates and then from sure. their lock-in? Uh, four economists, so we have to have four different viewpoints. <laughs> uh, I do believe that the uh, mortgage rates uh, will be at 5% uh, early next year uh, for different reasons. I think that inflation will be surprising on the upward side. So from the lenders, uh, they have to compensate for that uh, inflationary pressure in the, when they lend to assure that the purchasing power uh, the amount they receive back is uh, of equal. So inflationary pressure would be the one that it will lead to over 5% uh, mortgage rates. Now, in terms of the locking effect, we do conduct a survey of home buyers. Uh, why do they move? And what we find is that a uh, vast number move because they want to have different size home, typically larger size home. That is the reason why they move. And of course, that is more expensive. So they're willing to go into more expensive home uh, and that are indicating that that's the reason they are moving. The second biggest reason is the new jobs. Obviously, job is taking you, so you are buying a home at a different location. That's the bulk of it, about 50% of the reason why people move. Uh, additional 20% is due to the neighborhood consideration, whether they don't like that neighborhood, so they want to move out, or they have found a good school district, so they want to go to the school district. And that total of the, what the reasons that I mentioned represents 70%. When there is a question about cheaper housing, is that the reason why they are moving, it doesn't show up in our data. So I went through the other data, census data, as to why people would move uh, for reason for cheaper housing, and it is less than 10%. So reversing the question about the lock-in effect, would people move because of cheaper housing, I guess, uh, and it's less than 10%. So it will be interesting to see how uh, uh, Joe Tracy's results, uh, you know, is being based on his analysis of mortgage rates and also very interesting study on California property tax uh, situation and how that goes into the overall uh, demographic life-changing events, uh, having additional kids, uh, new school district, uh, new jobs, you know, whether that will be the factor. One other consideration is that we have to remember one-third of our homeowners are mortgage-free. They own their home outright. Uh, and we never consider somehow uh, these uh, free and clear homeowners that somehow they are locked in. I mean, if they see a better home, they move. 
Uh, so you, you, it will be interesting to see how it pans out. Uh, I don't think the impact will be that drastic because if it is, we're looking at po possibly 60% reduction in home sales. Now, from countries' perspective, maybe some people may say, well, it doesn't matter for the economy, it doesn't matter for the country, but from real estate industry, it certainly matters a lot, 60% uh, reduction in home sales, um, and that's quite drastic. Yeah. That would be a lot fewer commissions. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody think that this is an issue right now? Because I've seen some reports out there. There's one report saying, you know, as many as 3 million people right now in a what are we, four and a quarter percent, maybe four and a half percent mortgage rate environment could be disincented from moving because they have a three and a half percent rate. I find that sort of uh, hard to believe that somebody would not move right now because they would have to get a four and a half percent rate, which historically would be a great rate. But does anybody here disagree with that view and think that actually right now, one reason the market could be soft is because people don't want to you know, give up that 3.5% rate. Yeah. A couple of points on that. First, completely agree with Lawrence's comments about why people move. I think that really is, is the right breakdown in the Census Bureau data, as you mentioned. Agree with that. Uh, a second thing that we've seen, um, and this is again, so I think back to Stan's opening comments, there's been a bit of a rotation in the market. So you know, we've highlighted that purchase application activity is way down. We're still down about 15% behind where we were last year and really focused on Within that, it's low to moderate range purchases that are really weak relative to last year. The jumbo market is still doing relatively well. Another kind of that data is if you look at the credit profile of those borrowers. Um, probably not surprisingly, your absolute best credit borrowers, the guys who were getting the 3.5% rates on their home purchase last year, they really peaked in terms of purchase activity last year. What we needed was a bit of a rotation in the market. So for the guys with you know, 620 to 720 credit scores, who typically would have been 40% of the market, they're still only 15% of the market. Those are the ones being shut out by the tighter credit environment. If they had jumped in full force, we would have seen an increase in purchase activity right now. But for whatever reason, and there's a, lo a number of potential factors, those are people that are not, uh, that are not buying right now. So how this ties into, into lock-in is I think those you know, most sophisticated, probably higher income, you know, jumbo borrowers, those are the ones who are going to jump in and be most sensitive to that rate change. I think that sort of broad swath of solid credit borrowers who are the ones being shut out right now, those are going to be a little bit less sensitive to rate and more sensitive to their uh, job situation, other aspects of their financial situation. One other point uh, in terms of lock-in that we haven't talked about, you know, will it be an impact on lending beyond the purchase activity? And I think uh, there's going to be a potentially large impact on things like cash-out refinances, right? There was a time when if somebody was doing a major uh, home uh, renovation, uh, sending a kid to college, they'd refinance their entire mortgage and take out cash to cover that expenditure. I don't think that's going to happen, right? If you have someone with a 3.5% loan, they're not going to touch that first. They're much more likely to go to a, a second mortgage, a home equity line of credit, to handle that additional expenditure. So I think there'll be lock-in on that aspect. Anybody else on the idea that it's actually already holding back mobility or sales? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I don't think so at all. You, you look at the market today, and, and yeah, there's been a bit of a slowdown since last year, but that largely has to do with the fact that the last couple of years the market's been driven by the sale of foreclosures. There are no foreclosures now. Hence, that part of the market kind of drifted away. Um, we have yet to see what I would call the return, a major return of the retail buyer, the move-up buyer, the person who's going to the better neighborhood, buying the bigger house for, their, you know, for the kid, finding a job in another state. That wave is yet to develop, but we're seeing all the signs. Again, credit's getting easier to get. Home equity is starting to build. All the fundamental forces that drive that market are starting to kick back in. And, and by the way, this is going to be good news for the U.S. economy because one of the weirdnesses of this housing recovery has been the lack of single-family construction. You look at in the past, and you will, when you see the, start seeing the surge in sales, right behind that comes a surge in single-family permits. It hasn't occurred this time. But then again, if people are buying foreclosed units, that doesn't drive the move-up market, which doesn't drive new demand for single-family homes. That's coming. So there's a whole second wave out there, and, and my guess is, is by this point next year, we won't even have this conversation because the housing market's going to be doing great again. Yeah, I will say one, uh, one possible upside uh, risk to higher transaction volume is probably coming from the negative equity uh, coming off, which is there 
or a lot of households who maybe due to uh, having been in negative equity are now in, have been staying in their home much longer than they had anticipated maybe when they bought the home. And so as prices start to uh, erase that negative equity, we may see this kind of pent up demand for some of these moves that would have taken place you know, a few years ago, absent the decline in house prices, uh, but have been held, held back until more recently. And that could certainly happen well before we see much of an interest rate move. Yeah, I, I want to ask you, Lawrence, why, because this has been out there for a while, that as, as home prices rebounded, you would see kind of, you know, the shadow inventory of, of pent-up sellers would spring forth. And we haven't really seen that yet. I think the NAR numbers this week showed inventories were up maybe what, 6% from a year ago. Um, and those, that's 6% from the lowest levels in a decade. Why, why aren't we seeing more uh, homes being listed for sale right now? Um, so uh, one of the reasons uh, is that uh, if people go from underwater to above water, so now that reduces the friction, uh, it permits them to list their home, but they're also a buyer. It's rarely the case where owner purposely uh, turn into a renter. So in terms of the overall demand, uh, it's listing of a home, but they're also buying a home, it's a, so it's a net wash. Uh, only way to get a true inventory increase is for the home builders to build those new empty homes. And as uh, Chris alluded to, that's greatly lagging behind. Uh, another factor I think related to the lock-in effect is something uh, that may occur, I anticipate that it, it would occur, which is that accidental landlords. Uh, currently, the yields on you know, bank deposit is extremely low. So as people need to move, whether for the new job or you know, different circumstances, they don't want to give up their rates. Well, they don't have to give up their rates if they are renting their previously owned home. So they are renting that home out at, at the same time they are purchasing. So that doesn't help on the inventory front. Uh, but we may have more regular folks wanting to be landlords, given that the rents are rising. Uh, it's actually CPI apartment rents uh, is rising at 4% annualized for the four consecutive months. So the rents are rising uh, quite uh, strongly and it is anticipated to further rise because housing start is not providing the supply. So we may have this situation, we have many accidental landlords looking for the yields. It doesn't help on the inventory front, but it doesn't hold back on the lock-in effect. So they are not selling their home, but they are nonetheless buying a home because of changes in family circumstances. Yeah, Mike? Uh, so we are at a Zillow event, right? So there is the make me move aspect of, of the Zillow website, right? Uh, I think owners respond to prices. I think if prices get to the right point, that people are going to be willing to move. And this lock-in effect might push up that, that required price. Uh, mo moving is a miserable experience. As I know you just moved down to DC. Um, but I think I, that, that's the main thing con uh, constraining additional inventory is you need prices to go up a bit further. In many cases, get people above that positive equity watermark with enough to cover the sales commission. Uh, and I think, that, that'll, I think we're on the right path now. And if, if rates rise kind of along what your um, forecast shows, how, how does that interplay with prices? It seems as if uh, it could really put the brakes on some of the uh, you know, strong appreciation we've had over the past year, no? Well, I think the, the comment that several people have made that because supply is so constrained on the new construction side for, for a variety of reasons, and because inventory has been tight, supply is relatively constrained. The question is what's going to happen to demand? And if my view of a strong and, and accelerating job market continues, I think demand's going to pick up. So uh, that, that'll keep prices rising, but probably not as fast as we've seen in the past couple of years. Right. Uh, holding my some of those analysis I've done holding everything constant, it's about a one to ten swing. That is say when real interest rates go up about percent, you'd see it kind of impact the market, something on the order of nine, eight, nine percent in terms of prices. But that that's you know, the problem with housing markets is is it's very hard to see that effect on a year to year basis because the home prices are either going way up or they're going way down. It's either a bubble or on one side or the other, it seems like to me. But uh uh, but it does see the impact is there, and it should slow home price appreciation down. Right, and we're starting to see some of that, right? I mean, interest rates went up last year by about a, a point, and uh, prices are kind of slowing their pace of growth, Lawrence? 
uh, at least our medium price transaction, I mean, there's a uh, pros and cons. Pro is it's very timely. Con is it's influenced by the mix of home. Uh, but the mix of home over a long time span, one would think it would wash out in, because one would do not expect only a large size home to be consistently sold. So assuming it washes out, uh, right now the price appreciation is only 4%. Uh, and I would say that's much healthier because people's income growth is only 2 or 3%. So we did have a, a few years of a mismatch where prices are rising, double-digit rate of appreciation, income not growing, but now things are beginning to match up a little better. Um, but this, I think the home builders uh, will be ramping up, at least directionally. I mean, they are still underproducing, but directionally they are adding more inventory, more inventory, so that is helping relieve some of the inventory shortage pressures. I think Chris's point about real interest rates is an important distinction. Uh, it matters whether rates are going up because inflation increased or because the economy is uh, very strong. Uh, real estates tend to be a good hedge over time for inflation, so you know, increase at at least the rate of inflation or, or higher. So uh, I think that, that's going to be an impact too, is are we getting these higher rates because inflation's gone up or are we getting them because of just a very strong underlying economy? In either case, I think uh, home prices are still likely to increase, although at a slower rate. Joe? Another element that plays into, um, I think, the dynamics on price appreciation in those markets that really had the, uh, the, the largest sort of increases during the boom and then the crash is uh, we did some analysis where we look at the, uh, the price relative to like a replacement cost metric and found that in these boom bust markets, many of them prices actually over adjusted on the downward side we're below replacement costs, so obviously it's not in the incentive of builders to build, but there would be then an expectation of sort of mean reversion that prices would sort of move back up at least to sort of this replacement cost. And this is what I think was bringing a lot of uh, equity investors who wanted to come in and, you know, buy in this market. The question was how to, to manage this conversion into a rental. But that has largely played out. It looks like uh, in those markets, prices are now much closer to being back to uh, replacement costs. So we would expect that appreciation then to, uh, to slow down going forward. Uh, Mike, one point Stan raised was on the uh, assumability of FHA mortgages. Do you expect to see, and anybody else on the panel, expect to see um, you know, marketing, for example, by sellers saying, hey, you can take my 3.5% or if it's an FHA mortgage, maybe it's a little bit higher uh, rate with you if you buy my unit. Yeah. I think in certain markets that, can, that will happen, and I think that'll be a, a very effective way of marketing a property. Um, the, the trick is, it's, I say certain markets, because it's going to need to be a situation where home prices in that market haven't increased very much. Because if you have that FHA loan, it's amortized over time as the borrower has made payments. There's now a space between that home price, which and that home price will reflect the benefits of that assumable mortgage, right? It'll be priced into the, into the transaction. And so that'll increase the amount of down payment that the buyer will, will need to make. Um, and then you're into a case where if that, if that distance is too wide, do you need some subordinate financing to, to close the deal if you don't have a down payment large enough to, to, to do it. So even if that assumable mortgage may be out there, it, it may not be the, uh, the right all-in transaction for everyone. But, but I'd certainly expect a few years from now that people will market their properties with the assumability uh, feature being pretty prominent. Uh, we've looked at the really sharp increase in interest rates. So stand short at the beginning, the interest rate increased from 1980 onwards. But if one goes back to say 1978, uh, when the interest rates were about 8%, then within fewer, few years in the early 80s, it went up to 18%. So 8% to 18%. What happened to home sales during that time period? Uh, certainly many first time buyers cannot buy at that high interest rate. Uh, does it lead to lock in effect? Uh, what happened? Well, home sales plunge by 50% when the interest rate more than double. But then when the interest rate began to go down, it quickly, home sales quickly came back up, So, which implied that if there is a lock uh, in effect, it's only a short, brief time period, uh, assuming that interest rate is able to stabilize or, or moderate a bit. But I think the one potentially big lock in effect 
Uh, I see a very beautiful building right across uh, this way. I'm sure the camera cannot see it. I'm looking at the U.S. Capitol here in <laughs> Washington. Well, the rest of the country do not like Washington. I think the Congress congressional approval uh, rate is in the single digits. So the lock-in effect could come from Congress, which is the tax reform, which one aspect of the tax reform discussion was for most Americans, if they sell their home, their capital appreciation is tax-free for most Americans. Uh, Congress is considering changing that to lengthening the year from uh, three out of five year ownership to now five out of seven or five out of eight year ownership, which means that in order to get that tax free, free capital gains, one has to stay at their home longer period. And just uh, psychologically, people don't like to pay tax. So if they say, I have to wait two more years, I think people will wait two more years in order to avoid the capital gains tax. So assuming that if there is some movement towards uh, tax reform that changes the capital gains status on home selling, I think that would be the true uh, lacking effect. Um, what about adjustable rate mortgages? Are you surprised, Chris, that we haven't? After rates went up last year, we saw a little bit of an increase in arms, but it still seems to be pretty muted. Do you expect to see arms pick up here if, um, if rates rise? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably at some level. I think people are, uh, I, I think we don't use enough arms in this nation, period. Uh, we, we, we constantly push people to the 30-year 30 30 fixed rate, whereas other housing markets, say the UK, for example, it's a much more aggressive use of the ARM product. Um, one of the reasons I think people are shying away from ARMS is, is there is this ongoing perception that we are going to see a big increase in interest rates. Um, I don't see that happening. Just by, you know, Obviously, there's a difference of opinions up here on stage on that front. Um, and as such, you know, if, if people really do find that this is a stable interest rate environment, uh, again, I think maybe the arms will become uh, even that much more attractive um, on that sense. But uh, I would go back to the initial point that we're not seeing much in the way of use of mortgage products in general right now, as, of course, the MBA can attest to. And that has to do, again, with the idea that uh, uh, it's very hard to get credit out there today. And that, that, to me, seems probably the biggest issue in the housing market today, that, we, that the credit pendulum went from ridiculously easy in 05 to ridiculously hard in 2012. Uh, and then the question becomes one of, um, you know, how fast will that our credit pendulum get back to the middle where people, reasonable people, reason, reasonably risk people can go out and actually get a loan to buy a house. And I don't think we're back to that point yet. Does anybody here have a different view on credit that, it, that, it, that it's not too tight? Some people will say, look, FHA, you can get a 3.5% down. If you have a 660 or better credit score now, FHA insurance has gotten pretty expensive. But if you have the you know, the W-2 income, you fit within the four corners of the lending box, is that, uh, you know, isn't that a sign that credit is actually not all that tight? I guess I, by, uh, if you look at the product menus that are being offered, you look at the types of loans that are getting done, you know, whether it's a hard cutoff or whether it's a pricing matter that then uh, leads people not to qualify, I think, you know, both have the same effect of, of not having a lot of borrowers in sort of that next run of potential buyers. On the ARM question, um, so our data shows ARM share increasing from 4% to about 8%, so like you said, not, not a big increase. It's actually a much smaller increase than I think we would have experienced historically uh, with a similar you know, percentage point gain in, in fixed rates. And I think uh, at least a portion of that is coming from the new regulations, so the CFPB's Qualified Mortgage Regulation. The way it deals with adjustable rate mortgages is uh, you need to underwrite to the maximum rate that loan can achieve in the first five years of the loan. And that's very different from the way arms were traditionally underwritten, which would look at uh, sort of the fully indexed rate, for example, which is, which is lower than that maximum rate given where caps are. Um, so we've seen really the elimination of a lot of adjustable rate products. There used to be a one-year adjustable rate product, which was a fairly common loan, and it's really not, it's really not applicable anymore because uh, that loan obviously could move uh, a fair amount o over the first five years. And so it's, it's five one arms, seven one arms that are the more popular products. Uh, and I think that constraint on product choice, it, it is having an impact because I think some people would use an arm to purchase a home and then refinance later into a fixed rate. Uh, an arm is no longer an affordability extender the way it was uh, before. There's some good that comes with that. Obviously, that was abused, but um, I think it has having an impact on demand. 
uh, I may get into trouble with our uh, lobbyists because our lobbyists said, uh, be nice to everyone in Washington. <laughs> uh, well, uh, everyone. <laughs> Well, FHA uh, is historically for the first time buyer and for moderate income uh, borrowers. Uh, but the way they have raised the premiums and added fees, uh, the way I view it and the way I hear from the realtors is essentially they are ripping off the consumers. So if I, w I mean, it's almost as if the HUD needs to be turned in or turned over to the Consumer Protection Finance Agency to be investigated because uh, the, uh, uh, the premium levels are really outrageous. Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the, to your question, is it loose? Uh, definitely not. I think you know, it's tight and it's getting tighter uh, and there's no indication of uh, any loosening in my view. Now the FHA, if they were up here, would say you know, they, they had a, a brush with kind of reserve insolvency right. last year and I think they would concede that there's not too much room for premiums to go higher. But uh, if you look at FHA, uh, and Joe, I know you've done some research on this. I mean, from 2000 to 2009, every, every year in there, FHA estimated that their book would return a positive uh, return to Treasury. And in every one of those years, the FHA book has ultimately lost money. Um, 2010 is kind of, you know, um, maybe closer to the tipping point right now. So uh, agree with Lawrence that they've gone too far on, on uh Premiums, or is there room, you know, justification there, given the um, you know, the difficulty the agency has had? So there is a uh, a temptation uh, when you're facing this kind of uh, losses on your earlier vintages to try to you can't change them. They're already on your books. Uh, what you don't know is what the future losses are going to be on them. But to try to figure out. How can we offset those with stronger books of business going forward? And I think what was particularly important, too, is we had the demise of the PLS market. So the FHA basically was able to attract a you know, bigger market share and also better quality borrowers who in pre-crisis would have had other options for financing. And so there's a natural incentive to try to recoup some of your losses through pricing uh, the, the new books of business. Whether, you know, how far it's gone, uh, you'd have to sort of look at that kind of carefully relative to the, the risk profile of new borrowers. But um, this is a, a classic problem. We see it in uh, FDIC insurance rates. Uh, when the fund looks flush with money, there's pressure to cut the, uh, the rates that banks pay. When there's a lot of problems and the FDIC has to rescue a lot of banks, the fund is very low on money and they want to raise rates to try to replenish it. So I think there is an element of that certainly going on in the FHA. Would it have been better for the FHA in, say, 2009 to say, look, let's just take a slug of, you know, 20 billion or whatever, boost our reserves so that we're not making, you know, future borrowers pay for the mistakes of the past? Mike, I'll ask you, I mean, would that have been a better way to go? You know, I think FHA has been constrained as a government agency in how quickly it can move. And I think particularly in 08 and 09, it, uh, you know, after the fact, it's easy to say it would have been better if they had moved more quickly to uh, uh, really sort of tighten standards, raise prices then, as opposed to doing it now. Now, I, I think, uh, as, as you said, there's a political constraint, uh, which really requires them to try to replenish their reserves through these higher premiums now. Uh, there are two things that they're doing or considering that I think are, are Really, really good, shrewd moves. You know, one is the proposal to uh, allow borrowers who go through various phases of counseling to get uh, a benefit in the form of a lower mortgage insurance premium. I think that's going to be important, and it sends the right message uh, that uh, borrowers who are better equipped going into the transaction get get a somewhat lower fee. I think that I think that's going to be effective. The other thing that uh, that we've asked for, and I think that uh, FHA is considering. Um, they made a change last June. Uh, prior to that, the FHA premium canceled in the same way that a private mortgage insurance premium once the loan got to about a 78 uh, amortized loan to value ratio. Because of the position of FHA's insurance fund, uh, they moved to life of loan pricing. Uh, our suggestion is, well, uh, un understanding that you need to keep that insurance premium continuing because FHA maintains the exposure. That's the difference. The, the private mortgage insurer no longer has the exposure after the premium cancels. FHA has the exposure, but the risk has gone down a lot. 
So we're asking, well, how about after seven, eight, nine, ten years, lower the premium uh, to, to a certain extent? So sort of reward that borrower who's performed on that loan for that period of time with, with a lower premium. Um, that's not a big decrease in cost up front, but it will show up as a lower APR, and that, that is actually a potential qualifying constraint in some cases. Um, I, I want to go to questions from the audience, um, but maybe before we do that, you know, I polled the panel at the beginning on where they thought interest rates would go. Who here in the audience thinks interest rates will be above 5% uh, a year from now? Raise your hand if you think interest rates will be above 5% a year from now. And, and so who here thinks they're going to be below 5% a year from now? It seems maybe 50-50, maybe a few more who think rates will be below 5% a year from now. That's interesting. Um, so like I said, we'd love to take questions. Um, if, if you want to step up to the microphones, um, you know, please state your affiliation and uh, if anybody has a question. Excuse me. David Swift, Fannie Mae. I had a question. You'd mentioned the private label security market. What do you think that would take to get it back going? And also, what is the drag it's creating in its sort of non-existent state right now? Uh, I guess the big question is the private label security market dormant or dead? Uh, you could make a pretty good case for the latter uh, in that a lot of the problems that, uh, um, that we sort of became to understand why it didn't perform well uh, haven't been addressed yet. And so um, I think the challenge in terms of especially FHFA had this idea of trying to slowly crowd private capital back in. Well, that assumed that that market would start to revive. That's a challenging assumption. I think there's a lot of work that's probably going to have to be done to move it back into a, a state where it might start picking up some of the slack. So I'm more of the view that it's dead than dormant. And what are some of those things you think need to happen to... Uh, you know, the, the blocking and tackling, if you will, for private label securities? Well, one of the issues is uh, the, the issue with the rating agencies. And so you have the, the rate investors who don't want to take credit risk, and they were really relying, in some sense, on the ratings. And I think the trust that that investor uh, group has with the whole rating process was completely destroyed uh, in, uh, in the bust. And so trying to rethink, uh, you know, what should be the structure of, you know, these ratings and who should pay for what. I think we, they need to figure out how to rebuild that trust. Because without that, I don't see how the market comes back. Well, you're, you're kind of ignoring the obvious, which is the, the, the fraud that went on in the, the just pure flat-out fraud. That doesn't help trust. That doesn't help trust either. That was going <laughs> out in the lending process. I mean, the private label security is a great idea. The, the 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 system abused that I agree great idea. Yeah. Um, the, you know, securitization is nothing new. Fannie and Freddie have been doing it for for decades. So it's not like we don't have a model for how this can work. Um, we probably ought to be shifting back to a private label security, particularly if forces in D.C. get their way and and more or less want to reduce the role that Fannie and Freddie play in the in the market today. Uh, but again, you got to completely change the incentives. Uh, for the mortgage originators, uh, because right now, uh, you know, and anybody looking at that market, is, it, was a, it was a license to, to swindle. Let me agree a bit more with Joe than with Chris. <laughs> so I, 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 I think the structural issues that Joe pointed out, particularly trust in the rating agencies, but also trust in the, the trustees, trust in the pooling and service agreements, that, that the, uh, the, the framework is right so that people can, can uh, have confidence that things are going to pay as, as expected. But there's a whole other set of issues, um, you know, ca column economic. You know, right now, it's a much better execution to put a whole loan on a bank balance sheet. And you're seeing a whole lot of that, particularly amongst some of the largest banks. Some of that is a reflection of changes under Basel III, which really sort of tilt the scale towards loans away from securities. Um, some of that is just that banks are really flush with deposits right now. And they don't have a lot of good yielding assets to go after. And so mortgages look pretty good. Uh, a few years from now, once short-term rates go up, that may not be the case anymore. And there may be a demand even from those banks to, to open up the PLS market again. So that's sort of an economic hurdle. The, the third, call, call it regulatory, um, we're still waiting on the finalization of the risk retention rule. Uh, but possibly most importantly, uh, for a question from Fannie Mae, you know, we're waiting for some 
uh, additional progress on housing finance reform. You know, PLS really exists outside the realm of where the GSEs play. And as long as that line is still kind of fuzzy as to, you know, where can you sort of successfully set up shop and not compete against the GSEs, I think it's, it's a tough market to get started. That's a good question. Thanks. Yes, Tony Mungrove from Century 21. Um, in my mortgage life, I saw a lot of people with under 600 credit scores. And now I think what, to you, Joe, I think, uh, Chris, I'm sorry, is it what 40% of the population in America has less than a 600 score? So we're blocking out now a lot of homeowners who have the opportunity with all of these outright owners now with seller assist opportunities and is there any chance that we'll have an opportunity for people with under 600 scores who may have been on their jobs for 10 years with risk being redefined? Is that a possibility at all <laughs> to bring that back? Well, I mean, look, if your credit score is under 600, it's clear you've made some pretty bad decisions in your financial life. Possibly. Um, obviously, what needs to happen is, is less, how do we lend to people with less than 600 credit scores and more about how do we take people who have lower than 600 credit scores and, and train them to be better financial citizens, if you will, in order to get their scores up to a level where the, the lenders will look at them again. Well, not for a higher rate. Before, I mean, now we're looking at 80% and up. But, but again, I mean, the, the point here is that you got to take those people and train them to pay their bills and not take on too much debt all and do all the things, rates. but all the things you need to do in order to get your credit score up into the 600s and, and perhaps even, even the low 700 range. Um, ultimately, that credit score is a function of the fact that they are, have clearly had debt problems in their recent past. And, and you can't look at that population and say, well, you know, this is just some random number handed to them and that's not fair. They clearly have made some bad financial decisions. So we block them out of the housing. You no, know, what we market. need to do is help those folks clean their credit score up. That, that's my point. My point is you got to get in and work with these people individually and, and, and help them understand how you work within a modern financial system. And that system. happens dually with a low housing expense. And it's cheaper to own, like we all know, than it is to rent. So when you have these people faced with if they, if they, some of these people are lucking out and they're finding a house with 40%, 50% equity in it with seller assist, but they don't have any option now. Yeah. That no, it's, to it's back. a tough time. And, 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 you know, it goes, it goes back to how, how you deal with the whole foreclosure crisis that happened. You know, I was always of the mindset that don't try to stop foreclosures, rather help people repair their credit faster um, because to get them back into the market, but we never made those options. So we never a lot made those of the choices. foreclosure, though, also yeah. were people with a lot of houses that dumped them that had great credit but didn't care. Uh, if I can add uh, here uh, is that uh, I think people's frustration, again, with Washington, you know, for the rest of America, uh, is that uh, Washington tends to do either nothing or overreact. And I think the case of the, uh, about the people with low credit score, whether they can get the loan or not, uh, if the lender determines that this is an adequate risk in the rising, uh, home, rising home value environment, uh, banks should, should be able to make that loans. But now there is a constraint, uh, which is to say there needs to meet the qualified mortgage uh, definition. And if somehow that loan was to default in the future, uh, the bank will be sued. And any lender, the last thing they want to face is a lawsuit. So this uh, Consumer Protection Finance uh, Board with the Bureau with the uh, new qualified mortgage, uh, is that possibly overdoing it, overreaction? Uh, because it appears that banks with, they're flush with cash, and they're just trying to recycle that money, but that money is not being recycled with potential threat of lawsuit for people uh, lending to people with low credit scores. Well, and Mike, on that, how much demand at the MBA do you see for um, credit to folks who have, say, below a 620? Because at the, be at the beginning of this year, Wells Fargo had said for FHA, for their retail originations, they would go from a 640 was their minimum. They would go down to a 600. And I was talking to a mortgage banker, asking him why he hadn't seen more, uh, you know, how much, how much business was he doing below 640? And he said, you know, frankly, Nick, people with a 600 credit score have other problems, that, you know, whether it's down payment, whether it's their debt to income. It's, it's not that the credit score cutoff is what's keeping them out of the market. It's, you know, other problems in their financial file. Right. So I wonder... I mean, are, is it that we're seeing a lot of demand there and banks just aren't uh, willing to do it, or is it, is it more than that? I, I would agree with you that, that, that the demand's not, not there, and I think I would say it's, it's important to take it sort of one step at a time. So I mentioned that 
that swath of business between 620 and 720, you know, those are people that I don't think anybody would question. Those are solid credit borrowers who, who in previous cycles would have gotten loans and you know, would have been 40% of the business, now they're 15% of the business. I, I think that's the, the first item to address. I think the, for the folks below 620, I agree there, there are other, uh, uh, other hurdles there that I think you need to approach first. And I, I don't think you're seeing a lot of, a lot of demand at this point, uh, where I think folks in that 620 to 720 range, uh, some of those are, are uh, being denied credit. If you look at, uh, there's a report Ellie Mae puts out, you look, look at the profiles of uh, a typical denied loan, it's, it's someone with a 700 credit score, which is, that, that's, that's almost, almost unheard of uh, in, in the conventional space. Ed Pinto, AEI, just want to do a fact check. The median FICO score in the United States in April was 711 of everybody. It's not home buyers, it's just everybody. So there's not 40% of people, uh, individuals that have uh, FICO scores below 600. Thanks. No, 40% between 620 and 720. No, I think the state oh, oh, was got it, below got 600. It. I just yeah, not below 600, but under the requirement, which is 640. For okay, that's a different, but yeah. 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 Just wanted to correct that. So this question's for Lawrence. Uh, you mentioned you guys did consumer research on buyer motivation, and certainly home size was a very big part of it, and they actually want bigger. But with the constraints of affordability and the potential of interest rates going up, I mean, you know, when you look at a million dollars at 3.5%, um, you know, the real change in home price to that would drop to about 625 at 6%. So that could have a substantial impact on home prices. But... Did you guys do any research on the impact of function and size or home design? Because everybody wants larger, better, for less, right? So did, was home design or more function a part of that research? Because that's something we certainly have seen. Location and price continue to be the top three, but home design's number three when you consider that more than half the shoppers out there are actually boomers that want to downsize. And then you have the millennials who are just trying to get into the market, and that's that's certainly a big part of it too. And it seems as though we've got to get more functional with smaller spaces to address that affordability. Uh, so the uh, people wanting to move because they want a larger size that are often motivated by having additional uh, kids. Uh, sure, of course. Uh, but with the now the baby boomers are in the retirement age, sure. uh, I think we will begin to see some uh, downsizing on the size of the home. Uh, furthermore, among the consumer preference, one of the things we have noted in the past uh, three years is that uh, the single family home, which used to be the dominant preference, like 85% of home buyers wanted single family homes, now that percentage has come down to about 75% with the remaining going to condos. So either the baby boomers downsizing or the younger adults, the millennials, uh, wanting to live closer in, and only thing that's available is the condominium units. Uh, so we are beginning to see a dialing or changes in preference towards smaller size housing, um, even though in terms of construction of new home, it continues to show larger and larger size homes. And is there a correlation to the, the percentage that want condominium going up, I would imagine, correlated to the uh, constraint on pricing and affordability and things like that, too? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's some sure. Motiv additional motivation. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yours. Hi, uh, Ron Haney with ICBA. I would just uh, add, you know, to the to the discussion about the rate lock-in. I think there's another factor there that, and I don't know how you would ever track it, but you know, obviously we can look at the uh, the, the data that you know, shows that you know p folks getting mortgages or that got that three and a half percent mortgage in the last couple of years had a credit score somewhere around 740 or better, and that's that's all well and good. Uh, but it's not to, you know, you can't assume, oh, yeah, they got, a, they got their mortgage in their 740 credit score. Anyone that's gotten a mortgage in the last two and a half, three years, uh, my guess is it was probably the most painful experience you've been through. And I'm a former lender, a former banker, been around this business almost 40 years. And, you know, what's happened is if, if, I'm, if I've got that 3.5% loan, and while I actually might want to buy or down or downsize and, and you know, get rid of my house out in Maryland and get closer in, and so I don't have to you know cut the yard or whatever, 
I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about what I had to go through to get that 3.5% loan, probably from the lender I've been paying on time for the last seven, eight, nine years, and it was a horrible experience. And so that's something else that's going to factor into this. Uh, you know, are we going to move? Are we going to, you know, uh, change our living arrangements, whatever? And, and it's going to be hard. I don't know how you track that, but I think that that is probably more prominent than the fact that he has a three and a half percent rate. Now rates have gone up to four or five or six. And again, I you know I can remember getting a thirteen percent mortgage and like being just wow, I got a great rate. Uh, you know, uh, back in the eighties. So, you know, I, I I think that is something that we can't ignore. And what's driving that is the CFPB's mortgage rules. It's the uh, the overlays from all the lenders, driven by the uh, the repurchase fears. Uh, from the GSEs and FHA. All those things together have created this scenario where, you know, you have people go to, they're going to go get a, a mortgage and it's almost like it's, you know, I'd really go get a root canal, you know? <laughs> so I, I think that's a factor to, to, that we're going to gonna have to deal with. Yeah, and to your point, I, I see what you're saying exactly, but remember that moving has always been a painful experience. And that's one of the things we talk about this right lock-in, but as you, know, you just moved and you understand, it's, it's not just that. Yeah, that's a big hassle, but you got to, move. I mean, is there anything more painful or stressful than ripping up your entire life, throwing everything into a box and getting some movers, God forbid, to move those boxes from point A to point B? I mean, it's, it's an awful experience and there's huge costs. And, you know, the idea that somehow or other that you're willing to go through all that, the 6% commission and, and the painful moving and cleaning up and all that stuff that goes on, somehow or other you're willing to do all that, but because rates are a percentage point higher, nah, nah, won't, I'm not going to do it now. Seems silly. Uh, let me just see, uh, just well, very quickly on a lighter note. Uh, yeah, I think there's a tradition in Germany, uh, it's near Munich, where there's the Alps a mountain, uh, that to impress a girl, you really have to climb up the long hill where there's flowers that only grow on the very top. So, you know, it's not something easy to get. So it's a tradition where they have to work hard to get it, and then that's how you impress the girl that you really hike the long distance to we uh, use get the flowers. We use diamonds here, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I think the fact that you are mentioning that people worked hard to get that race, I think there's emotional attachment to it, and I think the other rational factors may play less compared to the emotional factors. They're proud that they got that rate and they don't want to give it up. Right. <laughs> um, well, that will be the last word. We'll end on that note and I'll hand it back to Stan. Thank you all very much.